Thank goodness, there's finally a Bible that includes all these absolutely crucial things within it. The U.S. Constitution, the Bill of Rights, the Declaration of Independence, the Chorus to God Bless the USA, the Pledge of Allegiance. Oh yeah, and the flag is imprinted on the cover. And not only that, it's the only Bible endorsed by President Trump. So Bibles that don't have the Constitution and the Pledge of Allegiance are not endorsed? I guess that makes sense because obviously Jesus was an American who only read God's personal translation, the King James Version. I'm just kidding, that doesn't make any sense at all. Please don't buy this Bible. I'm going to suggest that the very existence of this Bible is a contradiction. You can let us know what you think in the comments. My argument that this Bible is a contradiction is not based on the supposed separation between religion and politics, meaning policy. Religion, values, and therefore politics, which are hopefully based on our values, are interconnected. This is as true now as it was in the Bible's world. We should be honest about this so that we can hold our religious traditions to account and make them serve humanity and all of creation in life-giving ways. I'm thinking of all religions here, even including atheism as a religious tradition. Atheism itself can hopefully find more meaning for us than just nihilism. But that doesn't mean that someone should stand up in Congress and read Deuteronomy or Romans or the Quran or the Bhagavad Gita and sign it into law. And it definitely doesn't mean that we should imprint national flags onto our religious text. My argument's also not based on a belief that God is anti-human culture. God is totally pro-human culture, but human culture that has been transformed from one of egoism, fear, and hatred into one of self-giving love, mutuality, and peace. You can see that in the bookends of the Bible itself. In Genesis, the first humans get kicked out of a garden, and eventually Cain, the guy who murdered his brother, builds a city. This whole turn of events is presented as profoundly ambiguous at best and deeply tragic at worst. And at the end of the story, in Revelation, when God has redeemed the human species and restored the cosmos, humans are in a garden again, but it's a garden city. God blesses human culture that is restored to its life-giving beauty, connection, and goodness. So that's not the problem with this Bible. But there are serious theological, social, and spiritual problems when a singular nation, and especially a superpower, is attached to the Bible in this way. This attachment implies that the idea and reality of the United States of America is the outworking of God's providential will and desire for the world. It implies that the powers that be and the status quo are the way that God designed it. But this is a false inference and therefore should not be assumed or implied. Oftentimes, people don't realize how much the Bible has to say about life within superpowers or empires. But almost all literature in the Bible was produced under one successive empire after another from Egypt to Assyria to Babylon to Persia to Greece to Rome. So a lot of the literature is about how to build community and navigate life under such superpowers. And the social arrangements of these superpowers are pretty much universally condemned by the Bible, including Israel's own political, economic, religious leadership. The superpowers often presumed that the gods had chosen them for such power and control. For instance, Caesar Augustus, the great emperor of Rome when Jesus was born, wrote this of himself. I extended the frontiers of all the provinces of the Roman people, which had as neighbors races not obedient to our empire. I restored peace. But subjects of Roman power said things like, the Romans ransack the world and afterwards, when all the land has been laid waste by their pillaging, they scour the sea. They plunder, they murder, they commit atrocities in the name of their so-called empire, and when they have left the desert, they call it peace. So then, just as today, there were starkly different perspectives on the God's involvement in the establishment of superpowers. Regarding the view that a superpower is inherently sanctioned by God, the Bible mainly sees that as idolatrous presumption that is socially, politically, economically, and physically abusive. Here are some core examples. Jesus, for example, was a marginalized Palestinian Jewish social revolutionary who was criminalized and crucified by imperial and state power. The gospel stories identify him as the Lord and the Savior and the Son of God whose birth is the good news, meaning the gospel, of peace to the world. Now, none of this language was original to the gospels. This is language that the gospels took from the theological claims of the empire regarding the emperor. Within the empire, the theological propaganda was that the emperor is Lord and Savior and Son of God, whose birth is the good news of peace to the world. 
The Gospels took this language and applied it to their own story to say that the empire story was bogus. It said that the exploitative, dominating ways of human empire is not the ways of God. God's way is displayed in the healing, self-giving love of Jesus, who is the actual Lord, the real Savior who shows us the way of peace. Jesus identifies as quote-unquote son of man, which is at minimum a reference to the coming Lord who displaces the world's empires in the vision of Daniel 7. Jesus announces he's the one anointed with God's spirit, not Caesar and not the king and aristocracy in Jerusalem, to proclaim freedom to the oppressed and good news to the poor. Apparently, the world's empires are under the domain of the power of darkness, and Jesus rejects that power. Jesus eventually will die in confrontation with the religious, economic, political leadership and imperial rule locally centered in Jerusalem. The Gospels give no room for viewing the powers that be as inherently sanctioned by God, and that implies to the powers that be today, too. The Gospels, like the whole of Scripture, views the powers that be with profound suspicion and critique. And Paul was certainly no different. He founded communities all throughout the Roman Empire, many of which were directly Roman colonies, such as Philippi. And to them, he says, their citizenship wasn't Rome, but a totally different realm, and from there they are waiting for the coming Savior and Lord, Jesus, not Caesar. To the Corinthians, he says that they have one Lord, again, not Caesar. He mocks the quote-unquote rulers of this age, saying that if they had wisdom like they thought they did, then surely the incarnation of love wouldn't have ended up on one of their crosses. Despite Rome's claims to divine sanction and godly wisdom and power, their systems of value and practices of power were built on foolishness and weakness, obviously because they landed the actual incarnation of God's love on a cross, a cross built for society's supposed trash who weren't deserving of dignity and life. The presumption that the powers that be are sanctioned by God was the height of idolatry, foolishness, and weakness for Paul. And that doesn't just apply to Rome, but to the quote-unquote rulers of this age. The Old Testament fares no better in this regard. Just read any of the prophets or the whole of Jeremiah 7, which Jesus quotes in his confrontation with the Jerusalem leadership. So using the Bible to identify the superpower as sanctioned by God simply because it's the superpower very literally is a contradiction in terms. As a side note, this is not just about the Republican Party, because the Democratic Party is caught up in the same presently destructive American reality that desperately needs deep transformation. But positions like America First literally contradicts Jesus' values that state the first shall be last and the last shall be first. Positions that claim a creature as a savior is idolatry that leads to nothing but injustice and death. Clearly, this presumed attachment of national identity to the Bible is not just a contradiction in terms, filled with all kinds of biblical, theological, and social problems. It's filled with spiritual problems as well, since such idolatry deeply affects our relationships with God, and therefore with one another, and with ourselves, and with the whole creation. This Bible is a contradiction.